So today, of course, is a very special day in the life of our church as we get to uh, celebrate some uh, great graduates. I'll move out of the way in case somebody wants to take a picture real quick. Um, of course, we have four. We had a couple more that didn't, weren't able to make it this morning, but uh, we'll get to them hopefully later on. But uh, we just want to go ahead and recognize these guys. Let's go ahead and give them a round of applause before we... It's a great achievement. Well, we're going to start off with our youngest. I'm going to have you come over here, big man, so everybody can see your pretty face. <laughs> come right here. This is stand right, right here. Come on, come on. All right. So right here we have Mr. James Chambliss, big man, right? Yeah, graduating kindergarten this year. His parents, of course, are Crystal and Jason Chambliss. Um, we're happy that, that he's here, he's part of our church. We're proud of him for graduating. Uh, now, what you want to be when you grow up? You know what you want to be yet? You should have got a ways to figure that out, don't you? <laughs> I didn't know when I, I thought I was going to be a superhero or something. Or uh, probably like Weston last year, he's going to be a... <laughs> All right. Hey, buddy, we're going to give you a rose, okay? We're going to give you this rose right here, and what we want you to do is you take that and you give it to your mama, okay? Okay, so go ahead and take that and give it to your mama. Be careful going down. Up next, we got Hudson Durden. Oh, I'm proud of him, too. He's a, He's too tall, though. Um, keep having to look up to him every time he comes. Um, but his parents are Hugh and Jeannie Durden, and then he's also the grandson of Miss Jan and the late Mr. Larry Durden. Um, after graduation, these are his plans. He, he wrote a whole paragraph, just so you all know. Um, <laughs> he plans to attend Valdosta State University, and he's going to get his master's in dentistry there, then go on to get his doctorate degree so that he can be an orthodontist. So... Uh, all right, next we have the, the girl up here that makes all these boys look pretty now. <laughs> um, we have Miss Emily Claire Brookins. She's the daughter of Mr. Brian and Miss Sandy Brookins. Um, as far as after graduation, she plans to go to the University of West Georgia, which I knew that they were the Timberwolves, right? Yeah. Um, she's majoring in speech pathology, and she plans to study abroad which is awesome. And then last but not least, we have Mr. Lan Widener. He's graduating from Seminole County. His uh, parents are Charity Dillmore and Mr. Chris Widener. And after graduation, he plans to go into uh, Florida Panhandle Technical School. That's right. Uh, and major in welding, so he can be uh, working with his hands.
much for this day. Lord, once again, we thank you for these graduates, Lord, and what they mean to us here at the church, Lord, what they mean to their families. Lord, we pray that you do bless them. Lord, bless the time that we have this morning. Lord, as your word is read in a little while, God, I pray that you speak loud and clear to us and help us to hear what you want us to hear. Um, Lord, as we continue to sing these praises to you, Lord, I pray that we do just that, Lord, that we honor and glorify you through everything that's said and done today. Um, Lord, we do pray for those that couldn't be here this morning. Lord, we continue to pray for Brother Michael as he's away um, with the kids in New York. Lord, I pray that you continue to watch over and protect them, keep them safe as they head home. And Lord, we just look forward to, to having them back as well. And Lord, again, we thank you for, for this day. Thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. Just the gift of life is such an amazing thing. Lord, we ask that you bless this time this morning. And we pray it all in Christ's name.
makes their way down and the children make their way out to the children's church. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the uh, book of 2 Timothy this morning. We'll be in 2 Timothy today. Y'all go ahead and start that PowerPoint up. There we go. Well, this morning, I want us to uh, just real briefly, we're going to go back just a little bit in time to the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. If you remember those times, uh, there's a couple of big stories that really uh, are big names that rose up out of that particular Olympics. Um, One of them was a guy by the name of Michael Phelps. Um, If you remember, he broke the record of the most gold medals won in swimming competition when he won eight of them. Um, in one summer, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Then you had a guy by the name of Usain Bolt, which that joker can move. (laughs) Um, uh, You know, he he, he literally ran away with the 100-meter and 200-meter world records. I mean, it it looked like he was jogging as he crossed the finish line. He was so far ahead of the other other guys. Um, But then there was a third kind of crazy story that's connected with these particular Olympics that's not as well known, especially... In the U.S., um, because it, our team was involved in this, and the, uh, the the particular event was the men's and women's four by hundred relays. Um, you had the the women's part, and then you had the men's part. Um, and now, for the most part, the U.S. has dominated that event throughout the years. I mean, they've just completely smashed everybody else uh, running that particular relay. Um, but for the first time in the history of the U.S. being a part of the modern Olympics. They didn't even make it to the finals. Why? Well, the reason is they dropped the batons. And both the women's, if you notice right here, this baton, it's not in anybody's hand. Same right here. They dropped the baton, which slowed them down tremendously. So they didn't even make the finals. Um, And so this morning, uh, we're going to talk about good baton passes. That's what we're talking about today. In light of the graduates being here, especially these these seniors in high school, um, we're going to talk about passing the baton because today is a day where we honor our seniors for a significant milestone in their lives. This is super important what you guys are about to uh, do this week, this Thursday or Friday, um, whatever day you're doing it. Um, But see, graduation, it marks a a major transition moment in a lot of ways. Um, And really it marks kind of the end of one leg of the race um, and the beginning of another. See, with the relay, you have a four-by relay, you have four runners. You have four legs of the race. And so they're running one, and then they're passing the baton on to the next person, then they pass the baton on to the next person. Um, So essentially, you guys are are getting ready to start another leg of that race. Um, But it also makes a significant moment of empowerment for you guys as you graduate high school. Um, Both reaching the age of 18 and graduating high school, are really uh, these big uh, major moves towards adulthood, towards adulthood. Trust me, you're not there yet. (laughs) I remember when I was there, I thought I was. Um, You'll find out soon enough. Um, And in the months to follow graduation, uh, the move to college or or to the workforce are, are big transitions marked by independence. So you learn to be out on your own for the most part. Um, But to put it another way, um, you know, we are in the season of passing the baton on to our kids, and we're saying, go for it. It's yours. Go for it. Um, now, and, you know, we're looking at 2 Timothy this morning, and this is a lot like what's happening in 2 Timothy with Paul and Timothy. Um, if you know anything about the letters of First and 2 Timothy, you have the elder Paul, and he's writing to the younger Timothy, his protege, so to speak, his his. Paul is being the disciple, and he's being a disciple maker. He's making a disciple through Timothy, and he's training him. He's helping him to grow and become who God wants him to be. And so in, in verses 1 and 2, of, or actually 1 through 7 in chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning, we see kind of a relay race language. Now, if you know anything about Paul and some of his other letters, he used the same analogy a lot of times of running a race. Um, so apparently he knew a lot about athleticism, and so he kind of 
just, just compare that a lot to the Christian walk. And so that's what he's doing here with Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1, it says this. He says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Keep that in mind. The rules are important. It's the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So do you kind of see the relay race talk that's right here? Um, just, just, just look at it this way. Uh, first, Paul says, what you have heard from me. So Paul, essentially, he's run that first leg of the race. Okay? He's, he's been around the, the, the track one time. He's run that first leg. Um, he says, what you have heard from me. He's talking to Timothy. So Paul taught Timothy. So leg two is Timothy. And then he tells Timothy, he says, entrust to faithful men. He's saying, what I've taught you, I want you to entrust to faithful men. So Timothy's running that second leg of the race, and Paul's saying, when you come around, you're going to pass that baton on to other people, to faithful men. Uh, then you have the fourth leg of the relay, and he says, who will be able to teach others also? So your others, they're running that last leg of the race, is what Paul's telling him. He said, you know, it's a relay, and you're, you're, you're passing that baton on. You're passing it on to the next person. You're getting ready to, to teach them and show them. And I, I really love the picture that's created right here because it's, this actually should be at the core of what any ministry should be about. It's passing that baton on to the next person um, but especially our, our children and our youth ministries you know we should want to come alongside parents to see kids move past a religion that song we just sang says we move past a religion and move into this authentic relationship with Jesus Christ because that's what it's all about without Jesus religion means absolutely nothing you're just going through the motions um, and we then uh, want to see those kids uh, you know, take that relationship and carry it beyond the walls of the church. We all should be doing that, honestly. Carry it beyond the walls of the church um, and tell others about it. Share it with others. And the Bible calls that making disciples. And that's what we're all commanded to do. We're commanded to make disciples. If we're true believers, that's what it's all about. The problem is, though, uh, like with the relay races we saw in 2008 with the U.S., Honestly, we're seeing far too many bad baton passes or batons being dropped in the church today. Um, and for me, it has a lot to do with watching these graduates transition to life after youth group. Um, not only do I work with the youth and the kids here, um, I also serve as a college minister for BCM over in Bainbridge. So I'm connected with the, the state BCM. And, and, you know, my eyes have been open to some statistics that... And these, these are things that I've witnessed firsthand, and I fully believe that these aren't just made-up statistics. Um, but they tell us that, you know, 90% of graduating seniors, graduating high school, moving on to college, never step foot in church after they leave home. 90% of them. That's bad. That's, that's, that's sad. That's, that's really, that's, that should really bother us. Um, you know, once they leave home, it's... 90% of them never, they don't have any interest in the church after they leave. Um, and even the ones that are involved and actively involved in their youth groups and in the ministries at the church, uh, studies have shown that six, 40 to 60% of them never show up. I mean, these are kids that grow up in church, and they're involved in church. And after they leave, they don't, 40 to 60% of them say, we don't want anything to do with it. Um, now, the idea of passing the, the baton, um, you know, something's going wrong when it comes to the baton pass here. You know, if that, that high percentages of, of, of kids are, are just never having anything to do with church after they graduate. Um, but this idea of passing the baton, it can be expanded beyond youth ministries passing the baton to students. Um, it, it's for parents and grandparents as well passing that baton on. It's for Sunday school teachers, children's workers, it's for bosses, it's for uh, school teachers, um, it's for any believer in Jesus who wants to live out his call 
which is to go and make disciples. Um, you know, that's the command there. So how do we make sure 2 Timothy 2.2 2 works right? How do we make sure this baton pass works like it's supposed to? Well, this may sound a little weird, but I think we can pull some great lessons or uh, a good spiritual handoff uh, from the rules that govern track and field relay races. So we're going to look at three different track and field, U.S. track and field rules for relays this morning. Um, and we're going to use them to really turn this, this Second Timothy into a, a good handoff. How can we apply these rules to our lives as Christians uh, according to Second Timothy? Um, and so one of the first rules we look at is rule number 25 in the USTF, the U.S. Track and Field rule book. It says this, The baton shall be a smooth, hollow, circular tube made of wood, metal, or other rigid material in one piece. Its length shall be between 28 and 30 centimeters. Its circumference shall be 12 to 13 centimeters, and it shall weigh not less than 50 grams. No material or substance may be applied to the baton. So what can we learn? How can we apply that to our spiritual walk as Christians when we're passing the baton on to the next person? Well, uh, the first thing we can learn from this is this fact. It has to be the right baton. Yeah, there's a certain type, and uh, it has to be the right material, it has to be the right length, the right weight, and all that. So what is our baton as Christians? Well, our baton as Christians is the gospel. Let me go back one. Our baton is the gospel, the, the good news, the one true gospel uh, about Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's it. It has to be the right gospel. Uh, when it comes to investing in others, we can get focused on a lot of things that may be good things, uh, but they aren't always the right things. For example, when it comes to, to seniors graduating high school, a lot of times we focus on things like good behavior. You know, you want to be, behave in school so you can make it through school, right? Um, if we focus on good behavior, we focus on good grades, right? Got to make good grades. Um, a lot of times we focus on athletic success. Athletic success. And then we focus on scholarships because we hope those first three add up to the last one, right? Um, because college ain't cheap. Um, it costs money, so you hope you get scholarships. So here's the thing. Sometimes we get so focused on the good things that we lose sight of the God things. Um, but the thing we have to realize is that not a one of these things, and all these things are great things to focus on. You know, good behavior is good. Good grades is good. Um, athletic success is pretty good, too. And then scholarships are good, of course, when you go into college. But the thing we have to realize is that not one of those things matters without Jesus Christ being at the forefront of it all. He has to be at the very start. Um, and those things are good to strive after. And while a combination of those things may make you successful in the world, in our society today, um, you know, when it comes to God, they don't mean a hill of beans without Jesus being first and foremost. Um, all right, and then the next rule we're going to look at, rule number two in the USTF rule book, it says each takeover zone shall be 20 centimeters long, long 20 meters long, sorry, 20 centimeters will be super short, um, but 20 meters long, of which the scratch line is the center. It says, the zone shall start and finish at the edges of the zone lines, zone lines nearest the start line in the running direction. So I know that's kind of confusing, but uh, the second thing we can learn from that particular rule is the space to pass the baton is limited. The space to pass the baton is limited. Now, in case you're a little confused about that, i got a little, little diagram up here to show you what they're talking about here. When you're running that race, right here, Usually this, first, this guy that you're fixing to pass the baton to, he's, he's, he's waiting right in here somewhere. So he starts running as this guy's getting closer. And they have to pass that baton on somewhere in between this space here and this space here. Um, so they, they, they have to actually they have to be behind this middle one right here too before you can actually hand it off to him. But anyway, so they got, it's a, it looks like a long space, but it's not long when you're running as fast as they're running. Um, so the, the, the time there is limited, the space is limited, and here's the thing, if, if they don't uh, get, hand it off within that particular space, then they're disqualified. They have to hand it off within that certain time frame right there. Um, if they fail to do so, the race is over for them and that team. And here's the thing, parents, I want to focus on, on, on you guys for just a minute here about time management and priorities. Um, because typically during graduation season, one of the phrases you hear a good bit is, they just grow up so fast. 
They grow up so fast. They grow up too fast a lot of times, right? Um, I mean, it's like you blink, you know, yesterday you were changing their diapers, right? You know? And today, you know, they're getting ready to graduate. Um, and the thing is, there, there's a date coming where they're going to head out on their own. They're gonna, and the thing is, we have to make the most of our time with them while we have them. We have to make the most of our time with them while And here's the thing. Um, I want to challenge you with this because there, there may be nothing more spiritually valuable uh, to your kids' lives than your presence while they are present. For you being around while they're around. And there's nothing better for you to do than to live out your faith genuinely in front of them. Don't just talk about it. Live it out. Live it out. Um, and I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that the window for uh, your kids or anyone in our lives, for that matter, responding to Jesus has an age limit. You know, we, can't, we don't say that. Um, what I am saying, though, is there's, there is a window where you have the most time um, you have the greatest opportunity and you have the most influence to have an impact on your kids. Um, also, the Bible is clear, and we know it to be true just by living and seeing lives uh, be taken way too early, we say, but we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised the next breath or the next heartbeat, for that matter. Um, so we only have a little, little bit of time, it seems. And we have to take the time to share Christ with our children, with our grandchildren, uh, with our friends' children, whatever it may be. If you're, you know, just keep in mind that it isn't, just the, it isn't just the church's job to teach your kids about Jesus. Just think about it logically for a minute here, because um, think about the time they spend at home with you and the time they spend at church here with us. I think you realize you have a lot more time with them than I do. And so we need to, you know, I want to encourage you guys to take time to just live your faith out in front of your kids and let them see who Jesus truly is to you. Um, and I wouldn't just limit that to our kids even, uh, because, you know, most any opportunity we have to invest in others, we need to take it. You know, God regularly brings people into our lives for a season. And we have that opportunity to share Christ with them. And Paul says in Ephesians, he says, make the most of every opportunity. Take advantage of it. All right, then the next rule we're going to look at is USTF rule number 12. And it says this, The baton shall be carried by hand throughout the race. If dropped, it shall be recovered by the athlete who drops it. If or he or she may leave the assigned lane to retrieve the baton, provided no other runner is impeded, and provided that by doing so, the distance to be covered is not lessened. So here's one thing we can learn from that. Um, I guess I didn't put it in there. But th here's, here's a lesson we can learn from that. A dropped baton is not the end of the race. A dropped baton does not mean the race is over. Now, I always thought that if you drop the baton, that meant disqualification. But clearly, this rule may, you know, tells us that the race isn't over as long as the one who dropped it picks it up and the runner doesn't obstruct the race of other runners and they don't cut the distance of the race short as they grab that baton. Um, but what does this have to do with spiritual transitions? Well, I'm glad you asked because it means a lot. There's a, there's a lot of research in books, and I've already talked about it, that, that talks about you know, faith is being abandoned by youth group kids during their college years. Just being abandoned by them. As I've already mentioned, we're seeing that 90% of graduating seniors never step foot in a church after they graduate high school. Um, and it's, you know, that's scary. It's a legitimate concern, and it's a very personal concern for me. Um, because students are either dropping the baton in their postgraduate years or something is going wrong with the baton pass. There's a problem there. And a lot of the response when we hear research like this is we try to play the blame game, which is something we're really good at, right? Um, you know, you think w humans have always been good at that because you look at Adam and Eve when they sinned and God said, well, you know, what have you done? Adam, who did he put the blame on? Eve. And then Eve, who'd she put the blame on? Satan. And so, you know, we, we try to pass the blame on to somebody else. Actually, Adam ultimately put the blame on God because he said, it's the woman that you gave me. Brave man there. Um, stupid man there, honestly. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, some of the blame game phrases that we hear a lot when it comes to this particular thing, when it comes to high school graduates never stepping foot in the church again, one of the first things we hear is, well, it's the youth group's fault. 
You know, it's the youth group's fault because all they're doing is playing games and eating pizza. Well, if that's what you think, then by all means, please come join us on Sundays or Wednesdays, and uh, hopefully you'll discover something totally different than that. But now, I will admit that there are some youth ministries that unfortunately do focus more on entertaining kids uh, than, than, than Scripture being taught, but not all of them are like that. Trust me, not all of them are like that. Um, here's the thing, it's not just youth ministries that are doing this either. Sometimes it's entire churches that are focused more on the entertainment value than the Scripture being preached. Um, and then we hear another thing we hear as far as the blame game goes is we say, well, it's the parents' fault because they are failing in their responsibility to be spiritual leaders of their kids. Now, while that is a major problem, I will admit that, I do know of some parents that exceed in being spiritual leaders and still their children fall away from the faith. And on the opposite end of that, I'm, I'm a prime example of parents that did fail in that responsibility being spiritual leaders, yet somehow I ended up preaching here this morning. Go figure um, so while a lot of the blame can be placed there on parents, it's not the only problem. We can't automatically blame them. Uh, and then another problem that we see a lot, we say, well, it's the older church's fault. You know, they're just not, uh, they're irrelevant and, and, and hypocritical to the point where the younger generation wants nothing to do with it. Now, this isn't true at all for the most part. Because unfortunately, we do live in a church culture where too much emphasis is placed on, uh, or too much weight is placed on the music and the entertainment value of a church rather than whether or not the word is truly being preached and taught in each ministry. Um, in fact, studies have, have shown that, you know, most of the millennial generation, most of this younger generation is more interested in true worship through biblical preaching and teaching than what the music sounds like or whether or not, you know, there's flashing lights and fog machines. And I can go ahead and tell you this, the younger generation definitely isn't going to be drawn to churches that fuss, argue, grumble, and complain about everything the church is or isn't doing uh, and that's an immediate flashing warning sign saying, go somewhere else. So, but again, we can't place all of the blame there. And I find this whole conversation about the blame game real frustrating. Um, because, don't get me wrong, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. But I get this mental picture of, you know, you got these group of people, the baton has been dropped, and you got this group of people looking, they're staring at that baton, and they're passing the blame to somewhere else. They're talking about what should be done, what could have been done, and all that good stuff. Instead of, you know, what we should be doing, here's the thing. When we look at that rule right there, talking about the dropped baton, the key there is responsibility. Whoever's responsible for dropping the baton is the one that's supposed to pick it up and continue on with the race. And the thing is, you know, when we're standing around talking about the problem that's there, guess what the race is doing? It's continuing on. It doesn't stop. And so instead of standing around talking about the drop baton, why don't somebody reach down and pick it up and pass it on? Stop passing the blame on to somebody else. Now here's the thing. Some of us in here this morning, we, we fumbled the baton when we tried to pass it on. It um, might be through hypocritical living, it might be through neglect, whatever the case, we need to pick it back up and, and focus on passing it on to others. Um, there's some of us here who have, we've, we've received the baton, but we've, but we've dropped it. It's been passed to us, but we, we, we've dropped it. Um, maybe we, we've turned our back on God, maybe, um, maybe we... we um, you know, maybe we were caught up in our own selfish desires. Maybe it's been a slow drop. Maybe it wasn't an immediate drop. Maybe it's been a slow drop through apathy and just, you know, just distraction. But whatever the case, we need to pick it back up and get back in the race. Um, now, some of us, we're in that takeover lane, that short time there. Uh, maybe the parent with the teenager. Um, it, it may be the teacher, the coach, the Bible study leader, the boss, co-worker, anybody who has a Timothy in their lives, which, by the way, if you're a Christian and you're truly growing in your relationship with Christ, you should have somebody in your life you're discipling because we're called to make disciples, right? Um, so the one who's been walking with Jesus for years but you've never considered how to invest in others, well, it's who and how time, which is what that question up there says. Who are you going to pass the baton to and how do you plan to do it? 
Who are you going to pass it to? Here's the thing. It has to be a deliberate thing. You have to actually put some effort into this. It doesn't just happen like that. You have to run. You have to get in the race. You have to do something. Um, so who are you going to pass the baton to, and how do you plan to do that? Well, right now, um, I want us to take some, just a few minutes. Um, we're going to do something special this morning with these seniors. We didn't do it the last couple of years, but I just felt led to do it. Um, so you guys, pay close attention. Okay? Everybody here, pay, pay close attention right now. Um, because this goes for everybody here this morning. When it comes to passing the baton on to the next generation, you can't pass on what you don't have. Okay? You can't pass on what you don't already have. In other words, you can't share the gospel with others and pass on that baton until you've received it yourself. It doesn't work without you receiving it first. And here's the thing. I can hold out the baton all day long. I can try to pass the gospel to you all day long, but until you take it and receive it, it's not yours. That, that gift is free, but you have to receive it. You have to accept it. Um, and here's the thing. Jesus Christ, he, he came to this earth. He was born just like, uh, just like you and I as a little baby. Only he was born of a virgin because uh, the, the miracle there is conceived by the Holy Spirit. But he grew up and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And I can't imagine being a teenager and not once did he backtalk his mom or daddy. Not once did he stay out past curfew. You know, not once did he not do his chores like he was told to do. Um, he lived a perfect life. And uh, when, he, when he was about 30 years old, you know, he, he, he went out and spent three years preaching about the need for forgiveness and, 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 uh, of sin and repentance and humanity's need for a Messiah and, and, and a Savior. All the while, he was that Messiah. He was that Savior, and he knew that. He healed people physically, and he healed people spiritually, more importantly. Um, then one day, he was arrested under false charges. You know, they called him a blasphemer, a, a troublemaker, a sinner. And, you know, yet not one of the, none of that was true because, remember, he lived a holy, perfect, sinless life. But even after he was arrested, not once did he argue. Not once did he try to run away and get out of that situation. You know, he... Here's the thing. Even when they started torturing, they started punching him, slapping him, spitting in his face, ripping out his beard. Then the Romans, they brought out their, their tools of, of torture. You know, they had these whips that were designed to do nothing more than rip flesh off of the bone. That was their job, and they enjoyed doing it. They were good at doing it. So they did all that, and, and you know, they, they, they went, they, when they were through beating him, as Isaiah prophesied, Jesus was beyond recognition. You wouldn't even know he was a man. Then they took him up to the hill of the skull, Golgotha. Uh, and after he carried his own cross up there, you know, they, they, they laid him on it and they nailed him to it. They drove spikes through his hands and his feet. And they, then they raised him up like some sort of entertainment, some sick form of entertainment. So that everyone could see him hanging there on that cross with those other two thieves. And in the midst of hanging on the cross, you know, he uttered these words about the very ones who were causing all the pain and the torture he said forgive them for they know not what they do now i don't know about you but all of that sounds like true love to me that's true love there because although jesus was fully man he was still fully god and at any time he could have called down legions of angels down to wipe out everybody he could have come off of that cross he was god but he didn't why because he loved me because he loved you and you, and you, and you, and all of us in this room, and everybody outside of this room that's ever lived or ever will live. He loved the world so much that he died in our place because, you know, he knew that, you know, he died on the cross because we deserved to die there. That should have been our punishment because of our sin. We deserved death. We deserved our blood to be spilled on that. But he took our place on that. that you know, that's the only right that we've earned is to die. But he took that right. He, he, he took that place for us. And he, he loved us enough. He went through that. He spilled his blood. Then he died on the cross. He was removed from that cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But he didn't stay there long. Remember, that was Friday. And on Sunday, he was out of there. The, the, the stone was rolled away. He walked out. And then the good news was revealed that he was risen. Here's the thing. Death can't hold back the creator of the universe. It can't do it. 
Jesus arose from the grave, he walked right out, and the awesome thing is that he's still alive and well today, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's interceding on behalf of those who have put their faith and trust in him. And here's the thing, all this that he did, he did so that we could go to heaven and be with him for all eternity. He didn't have to do it, but he did it for us so that we could enjoy that. And he offers it to us freely, but he doesn't give us to it automatically. Like I said, you have to reach out and take it. You have to accept that. It doesn't just happen automatically. So maybe this morning, if you need to make that decision, you know you've never truly repented of your sin and, and put your faith in Christ and accepted that free gift. You never accepted that baton pass. Um, then I want to urge you to allow him to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. And if that's the case, then I want to encourage you to make that decision this morning. Remember, we're not promised tomorrow. So make that decision this morning. In just a minute, we'll have a time of invitation. Um, but finally, to our graduating seniors, uh, I'm going to ask you guys to come on up front here. Just, just stand along front here. Um, I'm going to try not to embarrass you guys too much. But, um, you know, uh, here's the thing. It's exchange lane time. It's exchange lane time. Um, you know, it's time for us to, bat to pass the baton on to these graduates right here. And, you know, we're not giving them a physical baton. But as a church, I want you guys to know that we love you. We're praying for you. And, and we hope that you're taking up your leg in the race next. Um, and Scripture points again and again to moments where there was a laying on of hands. What such moment was just earlier in 2 Timothy in chapter 1, verse 6. It says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. And today we want to do just that. We want, we want to, to pray a prayer of commissioning for these guys as they run that next leg of the race. Um, so before we have the time of invitation, uh, want these guys up here, and I want to go ahead and encourage... Uh, uh, their family, if you can come on up here, just come on here and, and stand around your graduate, um, stand around your, your, your son or your daughter here, just join around them here. Y'all come on up. Y'all don't have to be embarrassed to. <laughs> uh, we want our families to come on up and gather around these guys. Um, and then I want to invite others. I want to invite friends, other family. Uh, basically, if you have a heartbeat and you love Jesus, we want you to pray for these guys. So come on up, gather around them, pray for them. Um, Let's go ahead and make your way up front right now. Maria's going to play something quietly. Um, so come on. Y'all come on. And pray for these guys. I'm going to give y'all some time to pray over them. And then I'll, uh, I'll close up this time with a time of prayer. for sake of time we're not going to have an actual invitation but I do want to invite anyone if you know you need to make a decision in, in any aspect when it comes to Jesus today please do that um, if you need to talk with me 
Brother Mark's here. And I'm sure there's several people here that would love to sit down with you and, and to just talk with you about your relationship with Christ. Um, because again, remember, you can't pass on what you don't already have. Um, and we want to pass the baton on to these guys. I thank you all for coming and praying for them. Um, I'm excited for them. I'm going to miss them. I'm going to try not to cry too much. But uh, anyway, um, in just a minute, we're going to get to spend a few more, a little while with them in the back and eat. Looking forward to that as well. That's always my favorite part of anything like this. But, uh, but anyway, but I'll go ahead and pray and close this out. And as I finish, just, again, thank you guys for being here. Don't forget to come back tonight. Um, my brother Mike Griffin's going to be here sharing about our religious liberties. Uh, it has a big impact in our lives. And so you want to make sure you come back tonight and, and listen to what he has to say on that. Um, don't miss out on that. Continue to pray for Brother Michael as he heads back. And Nathan, um, pray that they come back safely. And Peyton, too. You know, <laughs> there's a bunch of kids going on that trip. But anyway, let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you again so much for this day. Um, Lord, I just thank you for, for these graduates, Lord, and just the, uh, Lord, just the road ahead of them, Lord. I, I know there's a, there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of weight on their shoulders now. And Lord, I pray that you just bless them. Uh, Lord, I pray that wherever they go from here, um, God, that you help them, Lord, to see the importance of seeking your will and your guidance in their lives, um, Lord, and the decisions that they make. Um, God, I pray for their parents, Lord. I know it's hard to, uh, to see your kid grow up and, and, and leave home, but Lord, I pray that you comfort them as well through all of this. And, and Lord, I pray that you help all of them, God, to, to know and understand, Lord, that we're their church. Lord, we love them, and Lord, we care for them, and Lord, we're here for them. Uh, Lord, if they ever need to make a phone call, Lord, as uh, some of the college kids know already, God, I'm here for them. Lord, they can call me anytime, uh, even if it's just silly stuff, Lord. Uh, I just love talking to them and spending time with them. But Lord, I pray, God, that you just bless them. Lord, help us as a church to continue to pray for them and care for them. Not just let this be a one-time thing, but let it be an all-the-time thing. And Lord, help all of us here today, Lord, to know, Lord, if we've already accepted you as Lord and Savior, Lord, our job is to be passing that baton on to others so that they can pass the baton on to others and so that they can continue to pass that baton on to others because we want the world to know who you are. Lord, you don't want anybody to die and go to hell, and Lord, we shouldn't either. And Lord, it's our job, Lord, you want to use us to achieve that, Lord, to, to share your word with others, to be your representatives here in this world. Lord, I pray that you help us to do that very thing today. Lord, again, if there's anybody here that needs to make a decision, God, I pray that you give them the, uh, the courage, Lord, to come and talk to one of us, Lord, because we'd be more than happy and excited even to, to talk with them and, and share with them your love. Lord, be with us as we leave here today. Lord, I pray for the food we're about to eat for the seniors and their families. Lord, I pray that you bless it and use it for your honor, for your glory. And Lord, as we all leave this place, Lord, help us to see the opportunities you're going to give us, Lord, to pass that baton on. And we pray it all in Christ's name.